Good morning and welcome to Stream 7 News this morning. We do want to extend a special welcome to all our guests and visitors this morning. Uh, I hope everyone had a chance to pick up a bullet from the lady. And if not, there's still plenty of copies left in the back for you and up here in the front couple of keys. Also, uh, during our after passive collection plate, if everyone would make an attendance card and fill it out and place it in the uh, collection plate as it passes by, so we have a record of your attendance. Uh, just a few announcements that we would like to highlight uh, from the bulletin. Norma Cost, it did have surgery on Friday to replace a heart valve. Everything went well. She was hoping to go home yesterday, but I do think they kept her another night, so she's planning to go home uh, this afternoon. Also, Samuel Cox, a student at Freed Hardeman, is in the hospital, and he is not doing well, so we want to remember him in our prayers. And then also, many of us are aware that Wayne Elkins is in the hospital right now, and he's not doing very well, so he would like to, Myra and Wayne would like to be remembered in our prayers uh, this week as he's battling whatever infection that he may have. Also, we want to continue to extend our sympathy to Gina Lewis on the passing of her uh, sister last weekend. And also, many of us know Tracy uh, and Keith McKnight. They used to be members here. Tracy McKnight's father passed away yesterday. Uh, we're unaware of the arrangements right now, but as soon as we get them, they'll be in the, the church office. So I know they would like to be remembered in our prayers as they go through this time of loss. Um, also, there's been a little bit of change up in our classes this morning. Dale Alden's class will be meeting in the fellowship hall, and Daniel Winkler is out of town. Uh, so he, his class, the young professionals, will be meeting with the young families class uh, this morning. And then this coming Wednesday night, Brad Harib will be doing a, a class on the Christian's response to transgenderism. So all of our adult classes will be meeting here in the auditorium uh, this coming Wednesday night. We'll announce that again uh, Wednesday night to make sure everyone's aware of that. Uh, the Wednesday night meal is coming up on March the 4th. There's a sign-up sheet in the back for you. Uh, if you plan to be there, please sign up so we make sure we have uh, enough food and everything for that. Today, the nursing home singing is coming up at 1 p.m. And then Liza Leader's practice today at 2 p.m. Uh, then February the 25th, this coming up Tuesday, is another Ladies Dig Deep devotional at 6.15 p.m. And uh, we continue to do the, the food drive for the Tennessee Children's Home. Um, I believe that's all the announcements that I have for today. If you would, bow with me in prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, we're thankful for another day that you have blessed us with. We're thankful for this time as we gather around your throne and worship your name. We are thankful that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. We pray that you be with each one of us as we enter into this period of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Our opening song will be number 19. Number 19. If you would, please stand. We're going to sing the first, second, and the fourth stanza.
Thank you. You may be seated. Our next song will be number two. We'll sing this song just prior to our scripture reading and our prayer. Number two. We're going to sing the first and the third stanza. Scripture reading today is from the book of Acts. And if you remember last week, uh, in the early Christians uh, in the Acts 4 talked about early Christians are in their joy in serving God's uh, pool their resources to help each other. And so we're going to start now in verse five, uh, chapter 5. So keep that in mind because this will continue on. Uh, chapter 5, verse 1. The certain man named Ananias but Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. That was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter had answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon the church and upon all who heard these things. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. So that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, 
that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go, stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together and all, with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prisons to have them brought. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. And when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priests heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. When they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this, this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us this opportunity to approach your holy throne acknowledge you as the creator of all things. What an awesome God you are, and what a blessing that we have to approach your throne. And we're doing so humbly, Father, and ask that you hear our prayer. Father, we're, we thank you for loving us, and we thank you for this opportunity to gather as your people to study from your word, to sing praises to your name, and we pray that our worship is acceptable to you. Father, we live in a world that is difficult. We live in a world that gives us challenges and obstacles that we have to face each and every day. Father, we pray for strength. We pray for boldness. We pray for zeal to always live for you. Father, you know our weaknesses and you know that we fail. So therefore, we ask for forgiveness when we do. Father, we pray for our missionaries, for those who are actively teaching your word, whether it be locally or around this world. Give them the courage that they need to always stand boldly for your truth. Help us to look at them and realize that, Father, we have an opportunity just outside these doors to reach our neighbors, the people we work with, with the people we go to school with. Help us never to be ashamed of your word, nor of your son. Father, there's been those that have been mentioned this morning who are struggling, who are in the hospitals or who are recovering, who, who are dealing with death in their families. We ask that you strengthen them and comfort them. Help us to be an encouragement to them as well. We look for opportunities, Father. Help us to Never be ashamed to open those doors and to look for ways to help others. Father, we're grateful for this place that we call our home here at Southern Hills. We're so grateful for our eldership, for our deacons, for our Bible school teachers, and for Garrett and his family. We're grateful for the light that we are to this community. Help us to always let it shine. Father, we've love you, and we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus. It's hard for us to even imagine about that beautiful prayer that we just sung about that Jesus uttered when he was in that garden, and he was faced with so many horrible things, and yet he still chose to die on Calvary's cross. Help us to live for him in all that we do. Help us to strive to be better students of your word. Help us, Father, to keep a strong faith. Give us that hope in our hearts 
to strive to be in heaven eternally with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In a few moments we'll be partaking of the Lord's Supper. To help prepare us for that, let's turn to number 265. Number 265. We're going to sing the first and the third stanza. <clears throat> Before we partake this morning and remember our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, two verses from the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. A couple thoughts there on that word transformation. Let's be excited this morning and happy about that transformation that God has transferred us to his kingdom through the one we remember this morning, his son, Jesus Christ. And let's also examine ourselves. Are we living a transformed life? Are we doing that daily in our walk with him? Let's now ask blessings upon the cup. Father God, we are so thankful, so thankful for that transformation into your kingdom through the one we remember now, Jesus Christ. We're thankful for that blood, that redemption, that forgiveness of sins, that perfect sacrifice. Lord, we're excited this morning to be living and walking in that kingdom. Help us, Lord, to uh, continue to share that with others, to be excited about sharing it with others. 
We ask now, Lord, that you would be with us as we partake of this cup, and we're, we do that in unison together in remembrance of your Son, Jesus Christ. We're thankful for that precious blood. In his name I pray. Amen. Let us continue in prayer. Father God, for these emblems, the loaf and the cup, we're thankful. We're thankful for this opportunity you've granted us again to gather around this table. We're thankful, Father, for that transformation. We know, Father, that in your word we are not to be conformed to this world, but to continue to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. This morning, Lord, as we continue in this celebration, let us examine ourselves as we should every Lord's Day when we partake. Are we conforming or are we continuing to transform our minds? Let us focus on that as we again partake of these emblems. We're thankful for your son. We're thankful for his life his death, his burial, and that hope of the resurrection, his resurrection and our resurrection someday. We love you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.
We now have an opportunity to give back to the work here at Southern Hills and to the Lord as he's prospered us. We are so blessed. Let's, let's pray as we take. Father, we're so thankful for your blessings, those physical blessings that you've granted us, the health together here this morning. We know there's many that would love to be with us in worship this morning and can't because of physical conditions that they're going through. We're thankful, Father, for the financial blessings that you've blessed us with. And now, Lord, you've given us the opportunity here to give back to the work, to the work of our Lord and Savior Jesus to share with others, to continue to work together here at Southern Hills. We're thankful for our leaders, our elders, Lord, and we pray, continue to pray for them and the utilization of these funds. Help us, Lord, to always be good stewards of the things that you've blessed us with. Most importantly, Lord, we're thankful for spiritual blessings, those blessings in him, in Christ. We ask now, Lord, that you would bless this offering. Be with everyone that's about to, uh, to give. We love you in Christ's name. Amen. If you're using your books this morning, we'd like to mark our song of invitation. It'll be number 125. Number 125. And just prior to our lesson, we're going to sing number 345. If it's convenient, would you please stand?
Thank you. Be seated. Let me encourage you to open your Bibles up to Mark chapter 12. And that's where we're going to be studying this morning, Mark chapter 12. Have you ever heard someone say that there are no bad questions? Well, that's not true. Uh, there are bad questions. In Mark chapter 12, we have a couple of them. And, and they're not bad questions because of the questions really themselves. They're bad questions because of the intent of them. They weren't asking Jesus questions because they wanted to learn something. Rather, we're told, they asked Jesus questions because they wanted to catch him in his words. They wanted to make themselves sound smarter than Jesus. And, and so what happened was you had this group of Pharisees and this group of Sadducees, and, and they sent some people, kind of a delegation, to, to go to Jesus and to just test him, to, to make him stumble over his words. He was gathering quite a uh, following, and they didn't like that. And so they sent this group, and you had the Pharisees win, and they asked him questions about taxes, and we're not going to go over that too much. And, and yet what they were doing is they were trying to put Jesus at odds either with the Jewish community or with the Caesar, right? And, and they were just wanting to make him stumble a little bit. And yet Jesus handled their questions just fine. And so you had this group of Sadducees. And the Sadducees didn't really believe in a resurrection. And so they tried to ask Jesus some questions about the resurrection, hoping again to make him stumble over his words or lose favor with the people. And once again, Jesus just handled their questions without much of a challenge. And so what you had was you had these people challenging Jesus and they were asking him questions. And, and we're told two of them. I, I kind of imagine that there were many more questions that were being asked and Jesus just like knocking them out of the park, right? I mean, you ask him, he answers it. They're trying to make him stumble over his words. It's not working. He's just answering all these questions with great uh, wisdom, with great authority. And, and so you have this man who's standing back and, and he's a scribe. You know much about scribes. They're kind of these experts in the law. And he seems to be somewhat impressed by the fact that, that they just keep asking him questions. And, and Jesus just knows how to answer every one of them. And so he's listening. And he thinks, you know what, I, I got a question myself. And so he went and asked Jesus a question. It says, then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceived that he answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Now, that's not a bad question. All right, some of the questions before were bad, but, but that's a good one. I mean, if, if you know, and, and this man did, Jesus did, God has given a lot of commands. As a matter of fact, as you read through the Old Testament, you read commands about the way the, they were to dress. You read commands about the way they were to eat. You read commands about the way they were to sacrifice things, about the way they were to plant their fields. And all, I mean, you, they just, there's just so many commands given by God. And the man says, okay, but like, what's, the, what's the most important one? And I don't believe this is only in reference to the Old Testament laws. As a matter of fact, the New Testament would tell us there, 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 there's laws God has given in the New Testament, right? Maybe that's what he's thinking, but for our context, we recognize that, that even the new law God has given, or New Testament, God has given all kinds of commands. What's the most important? I think you probably know already what the answer is going to be. Truth is, I've known the answer since the time I was young. The truth is, if I'm just going to be honest with you, I don't know that I've appreciated it. And until fairly recently in my life. Because Jesus didn't answer the way that, that many would expect him to answer. This is what he says. As Jesus answered him. The first of all commandments is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and great commandment. And so 
Jesus is, okay, if you remember, this is actually a quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Right? And, and what you have is Israel. And, and Israel's about to go into their promised land. And Israel's just really struggled with faithfulness to God. Israel's just, just had this up and down. And it seems like every time things aren't going right, they turn their back on God. And, and Moses is just she keep trying to reel them in, right? And every time something doesn't go the way they want, they start to they'll build a golden calf or they'll complain or they'll, they'll, they'll bicker or they'll say, I wish we were back in, the, in Egypt. And they just kept turning their backs on God. And so Moses is about to take them in. And they have all these laws, but he says, okay, hear this. Like, hear, O Israel listen to me now before you go into this land pay attention this is important you need to know this love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul with all your strength and with all your mind like what do you mean before you go into, like you keep messing this thing up and you keep wanting to go back to Egypt. You keep wanting to erect these, these statutes and, and images and worship. Like get that out of your, your God, there is one. They, they've lived in this kind of polytheistic society for so long and, and they don't really get this concept of there just be one God. And Moses is saying, no, you need to, when you go into that land, you know this. There's one God. And you need to love him. He's not detached. He, he's not some, some piece of metal or wood. Like, he's a real personal being who you need to love. All your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you need to love him. And, and, and it's those words, if, if you continue reading Deuteronomy chapter 6, I mean, you just got to nail them down. He says, like, you got to teach these things to your children. And, and it just goes, when you go into the land, don't let them forget. Like, you've got to love God. I, I think we need to talk a little bit about the word love because we, we just... Make it ugly, I think, in our society. We don't really know what it is. Um, the concept of love is, is really a pretty simple one. Uh, you've probably heard it said before, the Greeks had a lot of different words for love. I would say, you no, know, they had a lot of different words and, and we just attached love to it. But we translate one word love from a lot of different Greek words. But probably the most well-known of them all is agape. As a matter of fact, I was just driving down somewhere in Spring Hill recently and I saw, I think it's Agape Animal Shelter or something, but, but it's this concept of love, right? That, that, that we've heard the word, it has a basic definition. It means charity, it means benevolence or goodwill. It's about wanting good and, and doing good for others. It's about wanting to be right with others. I, I think I've said this before to you that, that love, has that basic definition, but it's a very fluid word. And, and what I mean by that is, is that what that looks like changes often. Uh, I think of it like water, right? Water is always just water. But if you put it in a bowl or a cup or a pitcher, or what, it kind of takes the shape and looks different depending on the container that it's in. But it's always just love. I mean, it's always just water. Well, well, well love's similar be, because love is always goodwill. Love is always wanting right for others and doing right for others. But well, that looks different, right? I mean, it doesn't always look the same. We're told to love our enemies and we're told to love our spouses. You don't really treat them the same, at least hopefully not, right? I mean, you don't treat your spouse like an enemy or your enemy like a spouse. You're supposed to love them both, but that doesn't mean you respond in the same way to each of them. It looks different. What's good for an enemy isn't necessarily good for your spouse. And what's good for your spouse isn't good for your children. And what's good for your children is not necessarily good for your neighbor. And what's good for your neighbor isn't how you treat God, right? You're supposed to love and just have this love for everybody. But, but that will manifest itself and show itself in different ways. 
And so he, he clarifies. He says to love the Lord your God. He says it's the most important command, the preeminent one, the first commandment. But, but he explains then how to do that. All right, the concept is you are in this relationship and essentially with God and, and, and you just want to be right with him. Right? The, the most important thing is to be right with God and, and to do right by him. To know who he is, to respect that relationship and be in that relationship who you're supposed to be in that relationship. That's kind of the, the, the basic concept of love. If I love my wife, then I'm going to be to my wife what my wife needs me to be. If I love my children, then I'm going to be to my children who my children need me to be. If I love my enemies or my neighbor, like I'm going to be to them who they, I'm going to respect our relationship. I'm going to treat my wife how I should treat my wife. I'm going to do good to her as my wife and I'm going to love my children and treat my children as a father should treat his children and be good to them and do what they need as a father. And, and well, he's my God. I need to appreciate that. He's not just a friend. He, he's not just another guy. He's my creator. He's my God. And I need to be to my God what is right in that relationship. What, what, what I need to do, whatever I need to do to make that relationship right. To do good to my God who has done good to me because he loves me and he is to me what I need him to be to me. All right, that's, that's the concept here. And it says that you love God. Well, how? He says, with all your heart. The word heart, when used in the Bible, often has to do with kind of the, what I've, I've defined sometimes, the seat of all emotion. You know, we talk about agape love and we say, well, it's not really a, an emotional love. And, and sometimes that's true. But it's not always true. I need to love God with all my heart. There's an emotion attached to that it's not just a logical reasoning or any it, it, there, there's a heart involved in the love that I ought to have for God an emotion that I ought to feel for God when I think of my God it, it ought not to be just you know just just he's this creator and just kind of detached from it or only obey him because of a fearful but but an emotion and a love that, that I have in my heart for him. Like obedience to him, it's not just like I'm, I'm checking off this list of commands that he's given me. I think about, well, even the concept of why we're here right now. I mean, we just took the Lord's Supper. You know, it's easy to do that because, well, it's Sunday and what you're supposed to do on Sunday. I won't argue that. It is Sunday. It is what you're supposed to do on Sunday. But like, is that why? Is, is that what that means to you? That you're just, you're just doing what you're supposed to do? Or, or do, do we recognize and appreciate? It symbolizes a love that God has for us. That he sent his son, Jesus the Christ, to die. And like, was your, were your emotions pricked? Were they touched? Did, do, do you have that type of a love for your God? It's not just at this time. When we speak to him in prayer, when we sing to him in song, when we just live our lives, are, are we just going through motions? Or do we love him? With all of our hearts. He doesn't stop there. He says also with all your soul. When the Bible speaks of the soul, it, it often speaks of kind of just all of us. 
I think it was C.S. Lewis years ago who, who said, and, and I kind of agree with this, not, I don't know, 100%, but, but, but he said, you don't have a, a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. Right? And, and, and there's a lot of truth to that. Sometimes we just think of like, this is who I am, right? I'm, I'm five foot 11, I'm bald headed, blue eyed. That's, that's, this, this is me. And then, oh, I have a soul as well that one day will be important when I'm raised from the. But, but we, we kind of get that mixed up. No, the soul is who I am. And it says, so, so, so with all of who I, you love God with all of you with your whole being, with all of who you are. Don't, don't give God like an hour here or an hour there. Don't give him part of your life. Just, just love God with everything you have, with your all, with your whole being. Don't let any part of your life be detached from the fact that you love God and then he goes on from there even, says, with all your mind. So we mentioned earlier that there's an emotion to love. Well, there's also a, a, a mental aspect to it. There's also a decision that has to be made. There, there's logic to it. Consider. Think about what God has done. Learn who God is. If, if you don't have the, the knowledge of who God, like don't just come up with yourself this image of who you want God to be. A lot in our society do that, right? They, they just think this is kind of the, the idea that, that is appealing to me of God. And, and then they love that. And if, and if God ever acts in a way that is unappealing to them, they detach themselves from, they say, like, my God wouldn't do that. Like, don't, don't just come up with this, this make-believe creature that, that, that you love. Like, know who God is. Learn God. Let, let your mind be involved. Understanding his character. Understanding who he is. Understanding what he's done and, and what he wants. And, and have this mental mind engage and love him with your mind. Know him. Learn him. Grow in him. And love him with your, with your thought process as well. And then, and then finally, he says, with all your strength. All right, strength is, is something that is needed when things get hard. Right? If you ever watch people working out, I mean, a, a big old strong guy could go into a gym and, and you'll pick up a five-pound weight and it just it doesn't look like much and it's just real easy. But he picks up a hundred-pound weight and all of a sudden you see those muscles bulging and the veins kind of come. Why? It's because now he's using strength because something just got hard. Like we're talking about loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And, and you say, well, well why, why is he giving this command? Remember, again, this is Israel going into the promised land. And, and the truth is this, we, we talked about they kind of have this, this up and down relationship with God. They fluctuated in their faithfulness. You want to know why that is? Because things got hard. I mean, we can sit back and we can look at the things that they were going through and say, well, they should have just been faithful. But guys, they were wandering in a wilderness. It was hot. It was miserable. And they saw no water in sight. And we could just say, well, they should have trusted in God. But it was hard on them. And when things got hard, they said, man, I wish we just died over there. Like, you don't say you just wish you had died if it was just real easy. It was hard. And that's when they turned their back on God. When things got hard. They saw Egypt pressing down on them and the Red Sea in front of them. And they just said, oh, we should have never left. Why? Because they were scared. And it was hard. And, and they were about to go into their promised land. And, and those things would be like everything wasn't going to be. They were still going to have difficult times. And what Moses is saying is like, don't let that be the reason why you turn your back on God. 
Sometimes things will get hard. And that's when you just need to you know, bow up and let your muscles bolt and just love God with all your strength. Don't, don't let your ever. All right, we've, that's one of the things that we, we just miss this. And like I, I've had friends on Facebook, like, uh, and I'm just telling like, I've had them friends for two years and they've loved 20 different people, right? I mean, I've just fallen in love with this person. And, and then that person does something they don't like and, oh, I don't love them anymore. Oh, this person did something like, oh, I love them. And, and then that person does something and they, they just hot, we just make love this really wimpy thing. And, and like, that's not love. When, when, when a man and a woman stand to get married together, typically what has traditionally been said is will you take it for richer or poor, for better or worse, in sickness and in health, right? Because life is hard. And, and there's going to be times that are challenging. And they're saying, okay, are, are you going to hold to this promise when things get hard? When there's money problems, when, when, when health isn't what you, when, when life just gets hard, so many give up. Are, are you going to be that way? And we promise, we say, no, richer or poor, sickness and health, better or worse, I'm sticking this thing out. Well, w- will you be that way with your God? No matter what happens, love him. When hard times come, will you, will you still love them? When, when challenges that, that inevitably will, inevitably, however you say that, when, when they come, will, will you continue to love God? Because that's what Moses is saying to do. And Jesus, when asked, what is the greatest commandment? He says it's this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And this is the first commandment. Not just love, but love God like this. So Jesus was asked the question. Jesus answered the question. Do you obey that command? Because that's the most important that there is. Above all commands, you need to obey that one. Above anything that God, you need to have that nailed down in your mind. That you're going to be right by God. You're going to do what's right. for. Obviously, that entails the other commands. That's why it's the first, right? Because if you love God, you're not going to say, yeah, God said to do this, but I'm not going to. It's the first command because, because within it, all the other commands are held. Tonight, Jesus has, has actually gone beyond what is asked. He was asked, what's the first command? He says, I'll give you the first two. And, and so I would encourage you to be here tonight because if, if Jesus is answering that question, you're going to want to hear what Jesus has to say about it. Um, but the question for this morning is this. Do you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? And if not, I, I beg you, spend time with your God. Get to know your God. Learn to love your God. Because your God loves you. If there's anybody in here this morning who's not yet a Christian, we want to give you the opportunity to become one. If, if you need to learn God and know who he is and, and, and figure out more about it, we would love to sit down and study with you. If there's something we can do this morning to help you get your relationship right with a God who loves you, We give you this opportunity now to come and sit on the front row while we stand and sing the song of invitation. Yeah.
point of the lesson this morning. In a few moments, we're going to depart for our classes. We do invite each and every one of you back this evening at 5 o'clock. We encourage you members, if you see a visitor, please feel like you feel welcome and help them along with the classes they can see appropriate for their age. With our lesson this morning, we're going to turn to the, to the back of the book where we're sending the greatest commands, our closing song this morning. <coughs> bow with me please our heavenly father we come to you thanking you for another lord's day that you've given us that we were able to come here and worship and study from your word and hear another listen lesson father we just are thankful for brother garrett and, and the lesson that he's brought us today and may we always remember that com greatest command father and keep you first in our lives father we ask that you be with those that have been mentioned as sick and we pray that you be with norma cost and we pray that you be with brother elkins and be with those that are attending over them and may they be a make a full recovery father and we also pray for those that have recently lost loved ones we pray for the mcknight family and the loss of tracy's father we ask that you comfort them 
Father, we ask that everything that has been done and said today is in accordance with your will and brings glory to you and your Son. We ask now that you protect those that protect us, and we ask also, Father, that when our time here is done, you need us no more, that you take us home to live with thee forever. Be with us as we go to our Bible study, and be with us this week, for it's in your Son's name we do pray. Amen.